Awesome, I'll get started. My name is Corey Bodley, an Assistant Director of Undergraduate Admissions at Emerson College in Boston. Um, we have a little slide, just a little bit about Emerson, if you haven't heard of us, if you're not um, sure about exactly what we're doing. We are located in the middle of downtown Boston. So what that means is we are an urban vertical campus, so not your traditional campus that's kind of in a set alone kind of isolated place. Um, we are right in the middle of downtown Boston on the Boston Common. Um, small to medium sized school, just under 4,000 undergrad students um, and a 700 or so graduate students. Most of those grad students are um, in an online program, so they're not physically here with us on campus. Um, average class size is about 13 to 1, and we do have 24 majors, 44 minors. Um, we're communication and the arts school, so your traditional STEM um, kind of majors and minors we don't offer. Um, our biggest programs are going to be visual media arts. Um, inside of that, the filmmaking, the animation programs are very, very popular. Um, our performing arts programs, musical theater, theater and performance, and a lot of that theater tech and design um, majors are also really popular for us. And then our journalism program is one of the top rated journalism programs in the country. So for any artsy students who love writing, different things like that um, might be a really great fit. Um, we are geographically di diverse. So we have students from most of the states in 70 countries. 20% um, of our students are international students. Um, and as of two years ago, we are a test optional school. Um, so students do not have to submit their SAT, ACT scores um, to be considered for admission to Emerson. Thank you. Rachel, Allie, go ahead and unmute yourself. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Awesome. Hello, everyone. I'll start. My name is Rachel Accavetti, and I am the Vice President of Programs at Chicago Scholars. Uh, so I have been with the organization for a little more than three years um, and held a couple of different roles in my position now. I oversee our college access and college success programming, so um, the direct service that we provide to students when they are in their first year of the program, which is their senior year of high school, as well as supporting them through the transition to college after they've matriculated to campus and supporting them during their time there. Um, but prior to assuming this role, I was the managing director of partnerships. And so I actually worked very closely with all of our college partners across the country, uh, which currently we have more than 190. And Ali will explain a little bit about that in just a moment. Um, but um, And then before coming to Chicago Scholars, I was on the admissions side of things. So I worked in um, higher ed admissions for a handful of years and actually established the partnership between Chicago Scholars and my institution. Um, and that is what brought me here. But now I'll kick it over to Allie to give more perspective on us as an organization. All right, hello everyone. My name is Allie Baird. I'm the Senior Manager of College Partnerships here at Chicago Scholars. Um, so as Rachel kind of alluded to, um, one of my big roles here is I'm the liaison between all of our 190 college and colleges and universities that we work with. So I develop those relationships, maintain them, and work very closely with them throughout the year, inviting them to our different events and through our different programming. Um, but I do kind of want to give a little um, overview of who we are at Chicago Scholars. You can kind of see the PowerPoint and kind of our um, kind of three-tier model um, on your screen now. But we are a seven-year um, college access success and leadership program. So we're not just getting students into college, we're seeing them through it. And then as well, helping them establish those meaningful careers once they graduate. Um, and so in the year one of the program and kind of the college access phase, as Rachel said, we start with um, students in their senior year of high school. We serve um, low income and first generation college students. Um, most of our population are actually both um, and all coming from the city of Chicago. We guide them through the application process, helping them find their best fit college and then um, making sure they enroll in that college when they graduate high school. Then we kind of shift to the college success phase and seeing them through college, um, making sure they have leadership uh, leadership opportunities, experimental learning. We have some grants to fund different opportunities for students like study abroad or internship programs, um, and really trying to um, ingrain our scholars to be self-advocates, um, leveraging their college network and finding those opportunities, which will hopefully lead to these meaningful careers once they graduate. And that's kind of the last phase career leadership development. Um, you'll see we have it listed two through years two through seven because really leadership development is a part of everything we do, um, but specifically supporting scholars once they're through college to finding those careers.
All right, team. So we're going to actually dive into our presentation. Um, and the questions um, that we prepared uh, came from many of you when you all uh, mm -hmm. registered for the webinar. We asked what were some of those challenges you all experienced or what some some of the topics that you wanted us to um, to uh, address. So here they are. Here's our first question um, to our panel. Uh, I'm new uh, to college access, right? Um, what is the purpose of partnership development and where do I begin? So I'll go ahead and start with that. Um, something I did forget to mention is that before I came to Emerson, I worked on the CBO side, mostly in college access and team development. So um, pretty much everybody on this panel does have a little bit of experience with both sides of the desk in developing CBO partnerships, but also being on the access and um, college admission side as well. Um, so basically, the purpose of developing these partnerships um, is to provide an extra benefit to not only your students, um, and their parents, but also your staff. Um, and this can come in so many different ways. Um, and I don't want to step on too much because we will have some other conversations about what that exactly is. Um, but in terms of staff, that could be professional development. Um, last week, one of my coworkers did a application reading kind of workshop for um, the College Crusade in Rhode Island. Um, and they basically have um, recent college grads embedded in public schools in Rhode Island. And they're helping students, you know, as they're creating their college list, whatever it is that they're doing in the college application process. So for them to have somebody from a college come in and just kind of explain our reading process was very beneficial for them. So that way they can just kind of understand what we're looking for. Um, for your students, that might be an essay writing workshop or to come visit um, campus. And for parents, that might be a financial aid workshop, maybe um, something like a FAFSA night where, you know, college admissions counselors and financial aid counselors are helping to fill out the FAFSA, whatever that is. Um, it really is what your students need the best, um, need the most of. Um, and in terms of beginning, um, I always would recommend if you're working with an organization that's maybe older, um, I know there's always going to be a lot of turnover, but any historical information you might be able to find would be very helpful. Um, to just kind of see what was done in the past, what worked, what didn't work, um, what institutions were you working with in the past? Because um, if you don't have to recreate the will, then don't do that. Maybe it's just something as restarting that partnership, reaching out again, um, you know, after a few years or so. Um, if you're from a brand new organization or maybe an organization that hasn't done this yet, um, a great way to start is just to look at your students um, and see what schools are they showing interest in? Um, you know, what schools are they going to visit? What schools are they thinking about applying to? Um, what schools are they actually matriculating into? Those might be the best fit for you to kind of create those partnerships. Um, and then another thing is to just think about specialties. Um, I worked at ACBO for about three years. That was a teenage radio station. Um, so basically the girls would come in, they would run the radio station. And we also did some like career development, college access work with them there. Um, we had a more partnership with Emerson because Emerson has a really strong radio station um, to where the girls were able to come in, um, you know, work at the college radio station as well. And also there was some admissions work that was done with them. So, you know, if it's a specialty that your nonprofit is um, kind of focusing on, then maybe also look for a school in the area that might be able to really like fine tune, fine -tune the skills that your students are working on, but also provide some extra um, support. Um, and then finally, in terms of getting started, um, I off the top of my head, I came up with three really important questions. Um, either if you're going to reach out to an admissions counselor, maybe the multicultural recruitment counselor, whatever school it is, um, questions that you should come into any kind of meeting with. Um, and the first one is, what is that institution already doing? Do they already have partnerships with CBOs? Um, and what do those look like? What are they doing? Are they more informal or formal. Um, and then the next question is, um, what are their priorities? Um, do they have any kind of enrollment priorities for the next year? Are they trying to increase their diversity or increase first generation students for that year? Because um, maybe that's another way that you can get in and you know build that formal partnership with them. 
And then finally, um, just thinking about the resources that, that um, they will be able to provide with you. Um, and I think it's best to come in with like a, an easy get or something that, you know, relatively quick that would be able to, you know, come to fruition pretty quickly. So maybe that is a workshop. Um, and then a middle one and then, you know, something that you know, maybe it takes a few months to do, but it's something that's possible. And then finally, like your pie in the sky kind of idea of in the perfect world, we, we would be able to do this for all of our students. Um, and I think that those are the best ways to kind of approach and start to think about um, building those partnerships. I don't know if um, Rachel or Ali has anything to add. Yeah, um, I would just add kind of as a little bit of context. Um, so Emerson is a partner of Chicago Scholars, and they are actually a brand new partner as of this um, academic year. And the way that this relationship started was actually with a cold call, um, I guess a, a cold email, but a, a warm email in terms of the, the content, um, but a cold email in the sense that we didn't previously have a relationship. Um, and so those, um, it can be as simple as that. It can, you know, require some additional digging. Um, but um, we found that some of our most fruitful and productive partnerships have actually started from um, referrals, for lack of a better word. So asking, um, so if you are a college that works really closely with with, you know, even one particular CBO, um, ask that CBO what other CBOs they should have on their radar. Um, it is a small, big community, and um, we love to talk about one another. We love to share resources and, you know, act as conveners and connectors, especially when, you know, even more students can be supported as a result. Um, so I certainly recommend, you know, asking, um, obviously, your colleagues at college fairs when you see, like, well, what else are you doing while you're in town on your follow visit? itinerary, what CBOs are you hitting up? Obviously refer to, you know, the green light um, directory of CBOs, but then asking around, yes, Brittany, I got you, <laughs> don't worry. The green light directory of CBOs is outstanding and um, not only has information about um, the CBOs themselves, but contact information, which is um, just a wealth of information there. Um, but referrals can be um, incredibly beneficial. Um, and um, I will also say, um, as Corey mentioned, you know, programming specifically for CBO partners, um, I have found out about and started so many new partnerships um, by being invited on CBO specific fly ins um, and visits to campuses. I know, again, that can be seen as kind of a, a distant dream in the future based on the resources available within your specific offices. Um, but if you can start to be that champion, if you can, you know, give examples of how these have produced fruitful relationships. Um, and if you need examples of that, we are happy to provide that information and we would love to be seen as a resource there. And the last thing I, think I would like to add is just look for those CBO specific programs. I know that we hosted a CBO breakfast last week um, and invited like Boston, Worcester, and Rhode Island nonprofits to campus basically to have breakfast the campus and talk about the different things we're doing in terms of diversity recruitment. Um, so just kind of be on the lookout for different things like that from all the colleges, because for the most part, I'll say that, you know, this is something that all of us are focusing on, increasing um, the number of students that we're serving from, you know, either low income backgrounds or students of color. So I'm um, definitely just be on the lookout for that as well. Thank you, team. All right. Next question. What are the key steps to building a mutually beneficial partnership between your org slash school and admissions? And are there any differences between informal versus formal partnerships? Um, sure. So um, I'll start and then Allie can um, jump in to add additional information. Um, Corey kind of hinted at um, this as well in terms of understanding what each uh, the goals of each respective organization or school would be, whether it's related to enrollment or whether it's related to acquiring of resources. So a very, you know, initial conversation should be, you know, the why. Um, we've had many conversations with schools that have started with, we're looking to diversify our pop population. Um, and while that's a great start, um, we need to have a little bit more information about how you see our specific students then, you know, being integrated into campus and being involved as active and engaged citizens, not just um, for statistical purposes. Um, 
couple of best practices in terms of, you know, how you start and what, you know, makes a relationship mutually beneficial. Um, I say this many times, if any of you were at my, my GWI um, presentation last year, plug for Guiding the Way to Inclusion um, for NACAC as well. Um, but there's no one size fits all um, approach when it comes to um, building relationships between colleges and CBOs. Um, and by this, I mean, Colleges, you know, in many ways expect the, the high school partners, the CBO partners to have a thorough and nuanced understanding of their schools. So, you know, the programs offered, the, you know, specific admission requirements, deadlines, all of that. Um, it makes a world of a difference to us on the CBO side when that same level of thought and care is put into the approach when it comes to partnership. Um, so understanding, you know, the different timelines and populations um, and supports that are provided by CBOs, um, a really great place to start. Um, so to think about um, these, you know, nuances within CBOs is to think, is this a school-based program um, or is this a program that takes place after school? Um, so to use Chicago Scholars as a, as a case study here, we are purely after school. Um, other, you know, we do work with our students during the summer as well, and so our hours are a little bit different then. Um, but for the most part, we're working with our students after school. So it becomes very difficult when, you know, college after college will reach out and say, you know, we would love to set up a visit. Uh, the only time I can meet with your students is at 1230 p.m. next Thursday. Um, and so while we're happy to, you know, continue to educate and spread the information about, you know, the nuances of our programming, it helps a lot when colleges will, you know, know that we are an after-school program um, and also know, you know, who we support. Um, so um, while we support students who come from all academic backgrounds, um, all academic interests, many different high schools, um, as Corey mentioned, you know, there's CBOs that have a very specific focus. Um, and so doing your research there, as she mentioned, can, can make a world of a difference. Um, I will also say, as someone who handled CBO relationships um, when I worked in admissions for a particular institution, um, it is both tiring and um, sometimes incredibly rewarding, most, most times incredibly rewarding to be that champion within your office, um, to speak up and speak often about what you are doing in terms of establishing CBO relationships. Um, but what is most important is that you ensure that you're not the only one within your office who knows about this partnership. Um, that is going to make it last through territory shifts and the inevitable turnover um, that happens both within the admission office Suzanne on the CBO side, and I'm sure we can talk a little bit more about turnover later, um, but I have found that when it becomes almost um, competitive within a college admission and office, like it can seem to be sometimes like territory wise, um, and you like hoard list of, you know, CBO partners, and you don't really speak up about the partnerships that you've established, then those partnerships tend to fizzle, um, and they don't tend to have the staying power that others do. Um, I'll start to talk about um, informal and formal partnerships, but since Allie heads that up, I want to make sure that she speaks about that. Um, I'll just kind of touch on, um, you know, the, the MOU process, the memorandum of understanding. Um, as an organization, we do require our college partners to sign a memorandum of understanding um, when they join us as partners. Um, what's key for you as an organization, as well as you as a college to know is where you're willing to bend and where you're not. Um, because we have those conversations daily um, to know, you know, where are our sticking points and what are our non-negotiables. And it makes going into those conversations a lot easier. Um, we found that a lot of our formal partnerships come about after we've established an informal relationship or an informal partnership. So an informal partnership um, can mean a school is saying, you know, our legal team, our VP doesn't feel ready to, you know, sign something. We don't feel confident or comfortable to sign on to something like that right now, but we want to collaborate. Um, and so that's kind of the entryway that we use in a lot of um, different relationships is to say, how can we collaborate? How can we, you know, provide you with some tools that you're still looking to get out of a CBO relationship um, that would then be beneficial to you? Um, but I'll kick it over to Allie to see if you have more to add. Yeah. I'll just echo also to what Rachel is saying about having multiple champions in your office. Um, previously coming to Chicago Scholars, I worked in admissions at UW-Madison, and although I wasn't the main point of contact, I knew who Chicago Scholars was and was involved with the organization in many ways, um, and so it did make, when there was staff transition, a lot easier for us to be like, let's not forget about this partnership and make sure 
um, that through staff changes and territory and changes, we're still caring for that relationship. So that is super crucial. Um, so like Rachel was saying, most of our um, relationships with colleges and universities are going to be through formal partnerships as we enter into these MOUs um, with them. And I find this to be um, helpful in a lot of cases because it sets out expectations on both sides of the um, of the street. For the college and university, we clearly outline this is what we're asking of you as we enter in this relationship. And also from us to Chicago scholars to our colleges, this is what we're going to give to you in this partnership. Um, so it's not a one-way street, we're going both ways. And so I think it's helpful to have that formalized and to be able to refer back to it um, to make sure both parties are meeting kind of um, their end of the deal. Um, but it is also going to be um, the case that many colleges maybe don't want to sign into that formal partnership. And so then or potentially we've had um, um, colleges reach out to us that maybe for whatever reason, as Rachel was saying, perhaps they do want to increase their diversity numbers. But we don't think they're quite ready to be a good landing place for our students. Um, and so we, we might not want to enter in that formal partnership, talking through how can we support you as you grow um, your resources for supporting students of color, for supporting first generation students, what kind of programming can we offer and training and collaboration um, to potentially create those different spaces for these students on campus and eventually enter into a formal partnership down the road. Corey, do you have anything to add kind of from the college perspective or potentially from your time as a, working in the CBOs? Um, the only thing I'll add is that oftentimes, and I think you've already said this, but you know, informal things do turn into formal things. And so just not being afraid to reach out and just, you know, do the small ask of whatever mm -hmm. that is, um, especially on the admission side um, for me and the multicultural team here at Emerson. Um, I can't think of a single time where we've turned down like a request to do something, um, you know, either an essay writing workshop or whatever it is, um, those smaller things that, you know, eventually two or three years later might turn into something more formal. Um, I think that's always just a really great place to start. Thank you, team. Let me make sure I'm unmuted. There we go. Uh, in what ways can college admissions support my programming through partnership? All right, so I'll take this one. Um, I came at this through a transparency lens. Um, and the first thing that came to mind was obviously financial aid, merit scholarships. Um, one thing that, you know, it's really great to just in starting these conversations about transparency, um, it's pretty easy for any school you can think of to find, you know, after financial aid, what's the average cost of tuition for those schools? What might not be easy to find out is what is the average cost after financial aid for this specific population of students that you're working with? Maybe that's first gen or students of color, whatever that is. And if that's information that you're able to get from your institution, it's really helpful um, on the CBO side to have that information. Um, so if, especially in the CBO, being just able to ask that and, you know, see if that's something they're able to offer you. If not, then, you know, that's okay. But it's something that just think, definitely think about asking for. Um, and then also just merit aid scholarships. So I know a lot of schools, um, they really push for appeals. So, um, you know, just talking with your students and making sure that they know that they need to appeal their scholarships, but on the admission side, also just being very clear with CBOs that, you know, I would really recommend the student appeal and just kind of talk about that process. Clarity in the process that we have here at Emerson is a relatively straightforward process. And I think most schools do try to make sure it's pretty straightforward. Um, but the thing I find out a lot is that students just don't know that they should be appealing their merit aid or financial aid um, award letters. Um, another thing I was thinking about is um, just transparency and communication. So um, some schools, their financial aid and admissions are one office together. And if that's the case, and that's great when we're talking about financial aid and merit aid scholarships, but sometimes they're not. Um, here at Emerson, we are two separate offices. We are need blind. Um, so in that situation, creating some type of communication pipeline so that people on the CBO side, when we do have more formalized partnerships, um, can know who to reach out to in financial aid um, so that they that way they can support their students in that way, as opposed to coming to us in admissions and then you know having to take a long time to finally get in touch with somebody or us just having to send them you know to the kind of generic call in line. 
it's really great to um, just try to make sure you have those formalized pipelines in place already um, for those partnerships. Um, Ali and um, Rachel, I don't know if you want to add anything in terms of transparency. Um, I would echo um, the importance of what you said about having that direct pipeline. So um, not only within the financial aid office, but also within other support offices on campus, we have found that um, being able to have a specific person that we know of, you know, within the diversity and inclusion office or, you know, within um, academic support and retention um, to direct our students to um, is immensely helpful. Um, oftentimes, you know, no matter how far out they are from our program, um, they will raise their hand back to us um, if they experience a challenge or encounter a question. And um, um, and so there, it's really important that um, we do know who exactly uh, we can, uh, you know, reach out to, uh, even if um, it's, you know, someone that it might change. It's important to make sure that that person then has an established relationship so that they can then communicate that back to us. Um, and it, it makes all the difference. Absolutely. And I know a lot of schools now are creating student success offices. We have one here um, and they are kind of the catch all for retention. Um, you know, we do have a bunch of other support services, but they are kind of like the one that makes sure nobody gets falls through that net. Um, mm -hmm. And they do really amazing things from helping students if they fall behind on rent or need a tea pass. They have a food pantry. There's a lot of different things that they're doing there. Um, and they also do that counseling for when students um, actually do request to withdraw or things like that or put their education on hold. So I think it's really great to have connections directly with those offices. Um, usually they're going to be inside of the same division or however the college is set up. So at Emerson, that is the case. Um, student success is inside of the same division as um, admissions. So we do have a lot of different um, partnerships that we have together. Um, one of the ones that comes to top of my mind is our Emerson Rice program, um, which is, like I said earlier, Emerson is a writing school. Um, we have a creative writing and a writing literature and publishing program. Um, somebody who used to work in the admissions office saw that, you know, there was a pretty big gap for students from the Boston area exclusively um, in terms of just the um, kind of, you know, the readiness in terms of their essays and the completion of their applications. So they created Emerson and Writes in what they thought would be a place where they can help students write essays, but it turned out that the students are pretty self-selecting and it become like became a really strong creative writing program. Um, that person transitioned into student success, but they still hold that program. Um, and one really amazing thing, thing that has come from that, and it's kind of like the tool that we try to model all of our partnerships off of, is that now there is a scholarship for students who complete that program. They're, um, considered for a full tuition scholarship to Emerson. Um, and so that's just another example of, you know, how um, we're continuing to support um, CBOs and students throughout that process. I'll just add one thing too about um, one way colleges or college admissions can support is like making that a very intentional handoff if um, to those support offices. So especially um, if students are at bigger campuses where things are maybe a little more siloed off and there's lots of different offices and support systems, um, making that introductory email or even walking the students over to that office I think is really helpful, um, especially when students become very comfortable chatting with their admissions counselor or their representative throughout the application process, you know, not just sending them, oh, here's the website or here's where the office is, like making that personal um, introductory email, that connection so that um, they feel more comfortable having that conversation instead of just saying, here's the resources, please use them and making it a little bit more personal. All right, team. So next question, in what ways can college admissions better advocate for my students, especially with special circumstances through partnership? And how do I navigate those conversations? I think we kind of answered most of this question. Um, maybe I went off on a little bit of a tangent on the last question. Um, so I think if everyone, Corey, Brittany, if you're okay, moving on to the next question, if anyone in the audience has specific questions about this, they can ask and we'll address it once we kind of get through these formal ones. 
Sounds good. All right, next question. What are your challenges slash successes wins to your partnership development efforts? Um, I think that one thing that we wanted to make sure that we um, did talk about was specifically how um, admissions can support with our programming efforts. Um, this is something that uh, Corey did start to talk to, um, speak to previously, but I think that the most um, important thing and what we're actually hearing from our students, so um, what we're hearing from our scholars in terms of their interaction with their colleges, be it partners or otherwise, um, is that they sometimes struggle to see themselves on campus um, as a student. Um, and um, this can you know, be resolved in many ways, but um, I think that um, first and foremost, helping them see themselves um, potentially fitting in there um, before they've even applied um, and then certainly once they've been admitted. Um, so Corey um, mentioned a lot about transparency in conversations in terms of you know having to navigate um, difficult conversations and I'd say that that um, goes above and beyond and in terms of setting you know realistic expectations um, but I would say um, the conversations that we have when colleges come in to present to our students, um, they are way more successful when the college actually kind of tailors that presentation to who's in the room. So obviously you won't necessarily know the, the details of each student, but you do know the specific population that you're speaking to. Um, so maybe, you know, less of a focus on, you know, the outdoor excursions that are available, but more about the specific scholarships that students can seek out separately um, or the, you know, free opportunities to explore the city there as a new student. Um, I would also say we talked a little bit earlier about um, CBO fly-ins. Um, so again, plug for College Greenlight. They have a really fantastic counselor fly-in. Yeah, I got you, Brittany. Um, a counselor fly-in um, directory and, and list um, categorized by the, the deadline to apply. And I know I've personally benefited from that, being able to um, apply to CE campuses as um, you know someone who works directly with students. Um, but the fly-in programs for students can't be replaced. Um, um, so making sure that um, I'd say first and foremost that the deadlines are reasonable. I know I have um, there's probably some people in the, in the virtual room here that I have battled with on deadlines for these fly-in programs. And I'm sorry, uh, but I'm not sorry. Uh, and I think that making sure that um, you speak often with the CBO representatives who work with the students um, that you're trying to recruit for these fly-ins and you ask them, is a you know July 1st of their of summer after their junior year deadline to apply to a fly-in reasonable? I um, think that you'll probably hear no from many people, um, but figuring out you know how can we make this accessible to more students that we're hoping um, will be able to take advantage of this opportunity. So knowing you know the students who might not have support um, throughout the summer, um, figuring out ways to get them. Um, also, flying programs that um, maybe have an added nomination program. Um, it can be difficult sometimes for when students are required to be nominated. I know that um, sometimes there that bureaucracy is, is necessary, but when that's an additional option, that's really helpful and you can pump that out to CBO contacts, whether at organizations large or small, um, to then allow them to um, you know speak to the students that they know um, are either interested already or are you know potentially really good fits for this program. Um, if possible, we always love when parents or guardians can be included in these visits. Um, I see that as being particularly beneficial after a student has been admitted and when they're trying to make a final decision. Um, that can sometimes move the needle uh, more than you would expect. Um, and I'll also add just having very clear um, and not, um, you know, hidden guidelines for, you know, how students can access these flying programs. Um, it can feel very much like students are trying to navigate unspoken rules sometimes when it's a, oh, you had to know that you had to ask, but if you ask, we'll fund the whole thing. And, and when we've uncovered those, we're greatly appreciative, but um, it makes, um, you know, it, it makes it more accessible to more students who maybe aren't coming from as well resourced of a high school or even as well resource of a CBO uh, to then be able to take advantage of those. Um, 
also in terms like in terms of what we've seen to make um, programs um, and partnerships successful, I would say just getting this, the stories, the student stories that can serve as what I refer to as ammunition to help you in building your case for the students. So um, we have an all day interview event called um, Onsite, um, the Onsite College and Leadership Forum, um, where we actually bring all of our college partners to sit down face to face with our students and students from around 32 other Chicago and Chicago land CBOs. Um, um, and hear the student stories to make sure that they know more about them than is what is readily available on paper. Um, and having participated as a representative, I know Allie's participated in on-site as a representative, those sorts of interactions can sometimes, you know, make more of a difference than, um, you know, even if a student, you know, demonstrates a, a great amount of need and fits your profile exactly because you're able to, or demonstrates a great amount of interest um, because you're able to see why is this student, you know, a really good fit? Um, and you're able to take that information back to your respective offices and, and sometimes, um, you know, make the case for a student that otherwise wouldn't be admitted. Um, so those are kind of some of the, the big successes. I'll let anyone else add. Um, and then we can certainly talk more about challenges, too. Coral, I'll let you maybe share some successes. So we're not hogging my time over here. And then I can jump in, too. Yeah, of course. Um, I um, am actually currently planning all of my fall travel. Um, and one of the biggest successes in our office right now um, is something I think Allie um, or um, Rachel mentioned is like that it's not just um, the diversity and inclusion team or multicultural team that is, you know, owning these relationships with CBOs. Um, and so that's something that we've actually been able to be really successful with this year. Um, my director and I did a kind of workshop with all of our counselors around like, this is, you know, this is how you're gonna use that green light list that we have to find CBOs and then also reaching out um, either for those one-on-one -on -one meetings or, you know, offering workshops or whatever resources. Um, and I think for the first year, we actually do have CBO visits pretty much in every territory that we're visiting. So it's really exciting for everyone, um, you know, that's, for us a relative like small goal that um, we were trying to reach for the year. Um, but I do think a challenge that we face is um, a, we're not always, um, for the most part, our students from Emerson are actually not coming from the New England area. Um, and so for us to not always be in the areas where maybe the majority of our students, like Texas is a really big area for us. Um, I spend like three weeks total there in this, this school year, but that's just not enough time for me to be able to interact with enough CBOs and all the students I would like to. Um, so I do feel like sometimes it's just that distance in time um, is a really big challenge for us. Um, and one thing moving forward is trying to figure out ways to do that more virtually in addition to um, the physical meeting in person as well. Yes, so let's actually open up for some questions, um, uh, unless Allie, you have any um, any thoughts to add? Well, in the chat, Mark kind of spilled exactly what I was going to talk about. Um, I think one of my successes um, in developing partnerships with colleges is also, it was we did a case study um, this past year. We've done it for several years, but really seeing firsthand um, kind of some aha moments for students um, as they work through a college admissions file um, and really get that insider scoop into what is it that our colleges are looking for when they're doing applications, how do they do it? Um, because I think that's the whole point of us having these relationships with colleges and universities is help demystify this application process to give our students more access and to see them in that space, um, connect with these colleges, not be intimidated by them anymore, feel more comfortable asking questions and feeling like that, yes, I can be successful through this process and find my best match college. So I think that um, was a huge, big success for us. Um, and just thinking about other programming that we can do in collaboration with our colleges to give students those kind of aha moments. Yeah, let me also add to that, just based off of my experience working with our CBO and college partners. Um, uh, we work with many of our organizations that are either very small or um, in very remote um, locations. And to Corey's point, um, 
technology and virtual experiences are becoming more accessible um, and viable options for college representatives and territory managers to get in front of your student population. So I definitely urge you all, especially if you are in remote areas, um, uh, to uh, you know, do a cold email um, and uh, offer uh, you know opportunity to do Skype um, or uh, G um, G chat um, to get that information out. And then when you have that opportunity to get in front of the college admissions, don't just allow it to be a you know a, a sales pitch on why that student needs to go to your that institution, but really. Uh, 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 inform our college admissions representatives. Some of them are very new, right? Um, tell them that what your needs are. Um, do you want to talk about match and fit? Do you need an essay writing um, uh, discussion um, or just tips and advice to help students, um, especially in this in this time of the year? Um, uh, I will also say um, and wanted to kind of get your thoughts, um, Allie and Rachel, for those small organizations, um, Chicago Scholars is pretty large, right? You all have a little bit more um, scale to leverage your MOUs and expectations. Do you have any advice for small organizations to kind of leverage um, community um, or um, uh, reaching out to um, larger organizations in their area. Could you speak to a little bit more about your community uh, engagement efforts? Yeah, I was just about to, to respond to that because I think that the um, what I hinted at earlier about, you know, want CBOs want to be conveners, they want to be resource sharers, um, you know, open source um, in many different ways. I'd say that um, one of the best things that, you know, smaller or, um, you know, CBOs that may not have the, the network just yet um, can do um, uh, to attract, you know, more attention from colleges or to even just get, you know, more face time with colleges is to band together with other CBOs, either in their immediate area or with a similar sort of population. Um, so it could be the case that it could be a virtual sort of collaboration, um, but maybe there are, you know, five small um, radio specific um, CBOs that want to band together and then, you know, reach out to Emerson about a program. Um or maybe it is the case that, you know, there are, like this is very much the case with us, um, other CBOs that might serve a smaller population, but they have something um, as well in terms of programming that, that we don't necessarily have. So if there's an organization that has just a fantastic CSS profile workshop, that's something that, you know, a lot of CBOs are struggling with. They, they have the FAFSA down, but they're working through the CSS. Um, that's something that we've reached out to our CBO partners um, to say, how can we combine our forces um, and make this resource available to more people and then actually have some colleges come in and support during this particular effort? So I'd say, Brittany, what you shared about, you know, leveraging network and, and building a community is huge. Um, because we're an after school program as well, we don't necessarily have, you know, an active audience here for our colleges at, at any given time. So when a school reaches out to us about a program to speak in front of our students, one of the first things that Ali will do is say, you know, is this something that, you know, you'd want to open up to more CBOs in the area? Because we do have that network. Um, and so it's more likely that they will get, you know, 20 students as opposed to, you know, five students to attend when we can actually pump that to our larger CBO network. Um, but it's only possible when we know the CBOs in the area or, you know, in the near vicinity that would want to take advantage of those sorts of resources. Um, but CBOs banding together to, you know, share contact information, uh, to share ideas has been incredibly powerful. Obviously, Chicago is at a benefit because there is such a powerful network of that here. But I see bands of that popping up um, around the country in different areas as well. So I would say, you know, take advantage um, when you can of those conferences that, you know, connect other CBOs to one another, um, you know, like Guiding the Way to Inclusion. Um, definitely take advantage of scholarship opportunities offered through NACAC, like the Imagine Grant and otherwise. Um, but I'd say the, the leveraging of the network piece is key. And we have a question from um, Raven. Um, 
who is new to counseling. So thank you, Raven, for your question. Um, and if you all have any more questions, please um, don't be afraid. Don't be nervous. You can go ahead and ask them. Um, so uh, Raven works with the Educational Talent Search. Um, uh, she serves up to 200 students. Her question is, how would I go about choosing um, colleges to be um, a partner? Um, so I know I mentioned this a little earlier as well, but I would start with that more specific thing. So, um, you know, if your students um, have a passion for something, then that might be a really great way to start um, in terms of just searching for the college in the area that might have that. And it doesn't always have to be the college in your backyard, but that might not be the best fit for you um, and your students. Um, it might be the state school that's a little bit further away. I think it's trying to find that best fit for the majority of your students. I know there's never gonna be like a perfect fit for as many um, students as possible. And another thing to keep in mind is depending on the size of your organization um, and you know the capacity that you have and the size of team that you might have, you might not wanna just pick one school. You maybe wanna have three smaller schools um, that, you know, or three schools in general that might, you know, fill for the most part all of your students' interest in what they're interested in, a, um, you know, a, attending once they're in higher ed. And maybe you do a large public, um, a small liberal arts private, and then maybe like a small specialized art school or something like that. So that way they have, you know, a, a wide range of opportunities. Um, so, you know, I think definitely don't just look in your backyard, whatever is the closest, but what definitely fits, you know, the majority of your students in their interest. I think um, Corey is right on the nose that making sure um, you're picking a school that is going to meet the needs of your students um, is important. And then if you have capacity to kind of think about um, the diversity of schools, um, knowing that you can um, have there's lots of different types of institutions out there. And so starting with one that could meet the needs of the majority and then thinking about different types of institutions to make sure there's um, a diversity of choice for your students. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and ask some questions because we're still getting some questions in. Um, regarding your MOU, um, how do you all uh, hold your uh, college partners accountable? What are data points that you guys um, track in order to see if um, your students are being successful and on track for success while at their institution? Yeah, that's a great question. And a lot of the MOU, um, I, I will say that for us, uh, we don't even get to the MOU stage until we have established certain data points have been achieved. Um, so specifically in terms of the graduation rate um, for our partner schools, but then uh, not just the graduation rate at large, but as, um, specifically the graduation rate for URM students on those campuses, um, as well as looking at, I'm sorry, underrepresented minority students on those campuses, and then looking um, sort specifically at within those those populations, those that you know most closely mirror our first generation and low income student population. Um, once we do then enter into those um, MOUs and that's more formalized agreement, um, we're looking at how our students specifically are faring on campuses. Um, we are still sort of venturing into that um, scary yet exciting territory that is data sharing um, with colleges. Um, and so that's something that um, is, you know, um, worth exploring, especially if, you know, you have the capacity to do so and you have the leverage to do so. Um, but as I think we've all seen in recent years in terms of making sure that students, um, you know, information is, um, you know, treated appropriately, those are delicate conversations, um, but worth having. I'd say that it's worth having those conversations from the start um, with partners um, to make sure that you're all on the same page. Um, as um, an interesting fact, it's within our MOU that our college partners are willing to engage with us in a conversation about data sharing. Um, even if it's not something that we have established with all our schools, we say that it, it's, a, it's a baseline requirement that our partners you know, are willing to talk to us about data sharing so that we can become more informed and so that we can inform them as well. Um, 
We are also benefited in terms of keeping our partners accountable by um, a certain level of our partners, our platinum partner schools. So we do have a couple of different tiers of our partners and our platinum partners identify a liaison on their campus um, to actually communicate back to us about how our students are faring. Uh, that's something that is written explicitly into their memorandum, memorandum of understanding. Um, and our students do sign a FERPA waiver in order for that liaison to be able to communicate back with us. Um, we partner and get information obviously from um, National Student Clearinghouse, as well as getting information about our students and how they're doing, because we want to then look specifically at how our students are faring on those campuses. Um, and certainly have had to have some hard conversations in the past about offboarding of partners.